Um, I haven't given you a copy of this slide yet. I will try and do that, um, uh, if not today, by Monday. Um, because this particular um, link there is a very useful little uh, app that you can explore different space groups with. Um, I'll put it back if you want to write it down. No, that's fine. Okay. I'll make use of the slides. Uh, now, this is um, work by a guy called Todd Yates, um, and I think he's in San Francisco, if I'm correct. Um, but what he did was a very, very silly um, kind of analysis that proved to be extremely illuminating. He basically went through the PDB, looked at all the space groups that were there, and noticed that some of them were much more favored over others. And um, it turns out that P21, 21, 21, which is a primitive cell with two, um, two elements there with a, with a half fold rotation into the space, um, that is very much more popular uh, than any of the other space groups. Um, and you can sort of look at this plot here. Um, it's actually fairly useful because if you have a crystal that you're not sure what the index is, um, you can you can refine your data or refine your structure against several possible space groups. But the order in which you do it is probably the order of how they're represented in here. So for example, if you had P2121, you ref refine your data against that space group, but you'd also try P21212, which is related to that. Or if there's another case in here, uh, that's, that's the other case there. Um, or, or P21 can also be, be in that space group. Uh, now, there is a reason for this, and it's basically due to energetics associated with the packing. Um, if you want the references for that paper, obviously you can look it up in, in Bernard's book, uh, but it's Todd Yates who, who published this. Um, and that's just the 20 most frequent space groups, nearly 90% of structures crystallize in one of those. If you have something that's down in this area, um, be thinking about what might be might be the problem with it. Um, and then the, uh, the data here is for uh, showing you which space groups have uh, screw axes or combinations uh, of screw axes. So if you look at the um, screw axis here, you can see that the, you know, P21 is more prevalent than P2, uh, which basically means that the, um, the number of protein crystals that show just those, the, the, uh, one molecule here and one molecule there is much less than the number that show one molecule here and a, a half one in there. And you can almost think of, of um, again, the Lego analogy here is that if you're building blocks with Lego and you put all these molecules and you line them up, it's actually very easy to take them apart. But if you start building them and you put it in on a screw axis, then you put it together, you get sort of a, a sort of a, a stacked, so what am I talking about? Stagger. Yeah, stagger, yeah. So, so you get this kind of effect rather than, rather than something that, that looks like that. Um, and again, uh, Todd Yates goes into, into the energetics about this, and it's quite convincing that the, the, having a screw axis is more favorable for getting uh, better packing. Now, I've mentioned the international tables, and um, this is what the international tables looks like. Um, this is space group C2. Um, each space group has a number, so there's 230 uh, different possible space groups for all crystals. Um, and I believe, what, what was the number I mentioned? Was it 63 for <coughs> proteins? 65. 65. 65 for proteins. Um, this is how they're actually represented in the international tables. And you've got these, these, these figures here. And if you remember what those figures were, the 
This shape here is symmetrical in, in two dimensions, so it actually means it's a two-fold symmetry there. This one here has those little tails on it, and that means it's basically a two-fold, but it's a screw as well. Uh, you'll notice in this case that there's actually one in the center. That's why it's C2. Uh, the, it's space group number five, and it's, the notation is C121. Um, or the one of the notations that's used is C121. For that one there, you don't need to worry too much about it. It just means that the, the in this particular case, uh, it's C-centered. Um, there's no, the rotation is one in the, the A plane. The rotation is two in the B plane, so it's twofold. And the rotation is one in the C plane. So there's, there's only a rotation in, in, in the uh, B plane. Um, these are the possible positions of where the, the protein can be in it. Uh, and this is just what the international tables looks like. Um, I just have a quick question about yep. notation. So in the table you showed right at the beginning of class, you had like uh, hexagon, you had six or any P four, two, two, four, blah, blah, blah. But now you're writing like C2 is C121. Yes. Uh, in this particular one, the first, the first thing here is C2 and the number five. Um, there is no the really standard notations. There's actually several different possible notations for space groups. And this C121 or C32 um, actually another notation for what the space group could be. Um, the final number there is, is basically how many molecules you get in the asymmetric unit. But that's one half of, of what's in the international tables. Um, it's probably it's probably a good idea to, to look up something like P2 and see what, what that one looks like. And uh, see if you can make sense of what the symbols shows with what what you know from P2. It's a very simple one to think of. Um, that's one half of what the international table shows. Um, the other half is this, uh, where it basically defines the symmetry operators. Um, it defines the coordinates within the unit cell. So you would have a protein molecule at 0, 0, 0, then you'd have one as a half, a half, zero, uh, because you've got that C centering and you've got that, that, that twofold there. And more importantly, what it defines is reflection conditions. So in this particular case, uh, are you familiar with Miller indices at all? Okay, so the Miller indice basically defines the reflection, H, K, and L. Uh, and for this particular case, if you have H plus K equals to 2N, where N is an integer number, um, you can see that one, H equals, so this is, this is the case where you see reflections. So you should see reflections at H plus K equals to 2N. You should see reflections at H equals to 2N, K equals 2N. Um, for all H, sorry, for all H, K, L. For H, 0, L, your reflections should be where H equals 2N. And what that means is that you only see reflections where your H indice is even. Uh, that means that if you've got a reflection where H is odd, it's not this space group. So this tells you what, what reflections you would see. And then what you have to do is take this list and say, OK, what would I not expect to see? And then you look through your reflections. And if you see reflections which are inconsistent with with these reflection conditions, you know that you have an error in the space group. So this is why you'd use the international tables. If you collect some data, you index your crystal, you integrate the data, scale it, and then when you use it in refinement, um, if, you, if you get phasing information, then the structure is not refining to, to something reasonable. It's staying at about 40 or 50 percent for the R and the R3. And you need to check your reflection conditions and see if it is the, the right space group. Uh, and that's where you have to start listing out the, looking at the data, rather than looking at what the program is presenting. Um, many programs will actually allow you to look at this X-triage. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, point this out. A few other ones will point this out. 
Um, now what's highlighted here, um, those are the operators for the general item positions. If you remember previously I said that once you have one position, you can get all the other positions by applying a matrix to it. These are the operators for that matrix that was in the previous slide. Um, those are the Brownness translation operators. So that basically says you have one, one and zero, 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 and then you have another um, uh, unit of the molecule at a half, a half, zero. So that just tells you that you, in that particular case, you have two in there. Um, and I think I was talking about those, that, that these are the reflection conditions, which tell us about systematic absences. And one of the things I, I will ask you to do as a question is take a space through, go into the international tables, and tell me what reflections are not expected to, to be in. So this will tell you the reflections that are. And then what I want you to do is give me a list of the reflections or some of the reflections that are not. So that was an example of, of what the space group information looks like. Um, if you have that information and you take your, your protein molecule and we put it at the origin of, of uh, the, the space in the cell here, then what we're going to do is apply some of the operators that we saw in, in that space group table. Um, so the first thing we'll do is apply the, or take the molecule and generate all general positions using the space group operators. Well, that one there we know is x, y, z. So we know there was one that was at x, y, z. And then we also know there's one at minus x, y, and minus z. Um, and if we go back to the, that's the, these operators here. There's one at x, y, z, and there's one at minus x, y, minus z. So the little top half is just a negative, negative notation. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is use the Bravis lattice translations. And I'll go back to the Bravis lattice translations. These ones here are the Bravis lattice translations. And we're going to generate all the remaining positions from the Bravis lattice translations. So we have these two positions here. And then what we do is take a translation of a half, a half, zero, and a translation of zero, zero, minus one. And you generate, in two dimensions, you get this kind of, this kind of uh, picture. Um, so you've got the x, y, z, there. You've got the minus x, y, minus z. If you remember, that's x with the uh, top part y and then z with the top bar. Then you have this position here, which is x, y, z plus a half, a half, zero. That's the translation operator we saw, which comes to x plus a half, y plus a half, z, and that pushes the molecule of that one. And then this one here is the same thing where we've got the minus x, y, minus z, plus this operator here. So you've got minus x plus a half, y plus a half, minus z. And one of the things that's difficult with this is if, if, if you want to go through and take a look at this, knock a dimension out and just try it in two dimensions on a piece of paper, and then, then start going to three dimensions. Um, so I'm sort of doing things in a little bit of reverse order here, because I'm going to I've, I've briefly gone into three dimensions, but I'm going to go into a little more detail about three dimensions here. But these are the, the, the key points about these. Uh, so you have your crystallographic coordinates. Uh, you have an x, y, z in crystallographic space. And the angles are not necessarily 90 degrees. It depends on the, the, the uh, 
um, the primitive cell that you're in. So you have an XYZ coordinate, and you have a positional real space vector that's defined as um, fractional coordinates in, in that lattice. Um, and they're limited to uh, 0 and 1. And it's basically a multiplier of the, the actual lattice size. So x is between 0 and 1, y is between 0 and 1, z is between 0 and 1. And the real coordinate is x times a plus y times b plus z times c, where a, b, and c are the root axis dimensions. Um, there's 14 three-dimensional gravis lattice that belong to seven crystal system, systems. Um, you've got the seven shapes, seven three-dimensional shapes, but you've also got the, fa the face centering or the body centering, which generates the 14 different ones. Um, only plane rotations and screw axes are allowed in protein crystal structures. That's because we, we change the chirality if we have a mirror plane there. This makes protein crystallography much easier than inorganic crystallography um, in terms of thinking what the space moves are. Um, there's a crystal symmetry operator which can define uh, once you have a, a position where all the other positions of the molecule are going to be in, in the crystal lattice. And then finally, you have space groups, and you have 65 that are available for protein crystals. Um, that little bullet uh, box there talks about how they're represented in the PDB. Uh, PDB is the protein data bank. You probably know that. I'll show you the scale record in the PDB and how that relates to what the, the space group and, and uh, number of uh, molecules in the asymmetric unit and in the cells looks like. And uh, finally, the space groups with the highest degree of freedom for connecting molecules in a three-dimensional network occur preferentially. And the most common ones are P2, 1, 2, 1, P2, and C2. Um, single screw axes are preferred over corresponding plane rotation axes. So proteins like to, to be staggered. Uh, they actually like three particular space groups, more often than others, P2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, P2, 1, 2, 1, C2. And out of those three, there's only another 62 possible ones that they could be in. So protein crystallography is a subset of general crystallography. Um, so I sort of popped into 3D a little bit. Uh, we're going to do a, a, a proper uh, 2D to 3D. Um, this is a, a mineral called millerite. Uh, and it was actually discovered by William Howard Miller, who lived from 1801 to 1880. When we talk about Miller indices, this is the guy who actually invented the, the way of, of, of uh, describing Miller indices. Um, that's just a picture of what Miller, Millerite looks like. Um, if you're ever in a geology museum or anything like that, nobody else is interested in it, and it's a fun one to go try and find. <laughs> um, but this is a unit cell here. Well, that's the unit cell, and this is a lattice. We're going to go in two dimensions here. But when I talk about Miller indices, what I'm talking about is a lattice within the crystal, but how it so it's made up of uh, a line or a plane in three dimensions that samples many individual asymmetric units. And in this particular case here, we've got the one zero lattice plane. And what that means is that in every distance A, the plane moves A over one, which equals to A, and B, it moves B over zero, which equals to infinity. So in the A plane here, it's moving uh, one, 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 one. And in the B plane, uh, I think I've got those labeled the wrong way, actually. It, it doesn't move any direction here, so it's always continuously slicing the, the crystal or the reciprocal lattice points in this direction. So that would have a two-dimensional Miller indice of one, zero. Now, um, this one here, we've changed the reflection. So if you remember the, the, the one zero line is down there. In this particular case, we've got the one one because it moves A over one in the A dimension, and B it moves B over one in the B dimension. 
And in this particular case, we now have a 1-1 one, one lattice line. So the past Miller indice would be the, the 1-0. This would be the 1-1. One, one. And if we were getting a reflection that was due to this lattice, it would be 1-0 for the reflection on the other one. This reflection would be the 1-1 one, one reflection. And what you see is we started sampling the, the crystal in one plane through there, and now we started sampling the crystal in another plane through that dimension. Um, now this one here, we've got the plane moving AO2 and BO1. And in this particular case, we're slicing the unit cell through the, the almost uh, midsection of it. Now, uh, this is still going through a unit of uh, these last points, we're still get a reflection. But you can, can you see how the planes have actually become closer and closer together? So what that means is that the 1-0 reflection is sampling a large spacing. So 1-0 is low resolution. 1-1 one, one is sampling a slightly higher spacing. So it's medium resolution. In this case, we've got 1-2, which is starting to sample the, the crystal more finely. So we're starting to build up more detail about the crystal. We're doing finer slices through it. And if you take that to the analogy of the, you know, the the, the ten zero or the twenty zero or the, the 30, 35 reflection, you're making finer and finer slices through the crystal lattice, and that's why you're seeing more and more detail there. That's the, those reflections steam the the one zero reflections in the center of the diffraction data, and as you move out, you get the higher order reflections because they're sampling the crystal in more detail. And the, the reflection angle is proportional to the detail. That's where Bragg's law comes in. And lambda's 2d sine theta, where lambda is the wavelength, d is the spacing that you're sampling, and theta is the angle where the reflection occurs. Um, now, this particular case is more interesting. Um, Actually, it's not more interesting. <laughs> um, it, it, it just makes the point that being A over 2 and B over 3, it's moving it finer and finer and finer. Uh, what I thought this slide was, was one where um, the reflection actually goes through here. Um, I need a pointer or something. Ah. Uh, there we go. Where's the laser here? I can move it over. Let's make sure that. Is it remote now? There's a little switch on the left side. Yeah, I'm kind of on the left side. Oh, right. Ah, come on. That's what the HDs do. I've resorted to some Anglo Saxon language here. You're <laughs> uh, on TV. Yeah, so, be very careful. Uh, I'm wondering if I've actually got an example. So I don't know if I've got an example coming up. I can look at the next slide on this. Um, and I can't remember the, the, if I have an example of this or not. But you notice how this line bisects this reciprocal space lattice point, that lattice point there. So that's only bisecting a couple of lattice points. Uh, because we're going finer and finer detail. Now, diffraction is a property of constructive interference. So um, what happens is you draw this so terrible markers. <laughs> so if you have two waves and you have a second wave, it's Like that. When you add these together, the final wave is, is that distance plus this, because they're in phase, and that will be twice that down there, twice that down there. So what this means is that diffraction, because of that plane crossing that reciprocal lattice point, every time it crosses that reciprocal lattice point, you're getting constructive interference, because all these are the same proteins that are in these positions. So you have a question? This isn't reciprocal lattice space, is oh, it? This is sorry, real space. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Um, 
But what it means is every time you cut through the lattice and you hit one of these, you're generating a wave um, that's in phase with the next wave here. So you're, you're multiplying that signal. And this is, um, this is a very, very simplified uh, explanation of this. But the finer you slice this, the less lattice points you start going through. So the higher the resolution, the less lattice points you hit, and the less uh, constructive interference you get, the less detail you get, the lower the intensity of the reflection. So if you're thinking of an X-ray crystal diffraction pattern, in the center of the pattern are the reflections that have a low Miller indice. And that means there are reflections that are sampling this with a very, very coarse slice through it. And if you're sampling quite a coarse slice, some of those reflections can hit every single one of those reciprocal lattice points. As you, as you increase the newer indice, you're actually doing a finer and finer sampling in free space. And what that means is you actually start hitting fewer of these uh, reciprocal lattice points. As you're sampling a finer free space and the newer indice is higher, the despacing is, that you're looking at is a smaller spacing. Your angular extent of the spot increases. So instead of spots being around the beanstalk at the center of the pattern, we are seeing spots at the further away from the beanstalk. And those spots are less intense because they're actually sampling less of the reciprocal lattice points. There's, there's, there's a lot more math to that as well. There's a lot of other things involved. Um, but that, that is sort of a conceptually very simple way to think of what the Miller indices mean and also why a diffraction pattern is intense at the, the center and then gets less intense as it goes further out. Um, this is just an example of two on. Oh, yeah, what I wanted to say about this is, um, do we have that? No, we can, we can show all three of them. Um, so here's, here's all three of them now. And you can see for the, the one zero one, you've got this kind of spacing that you're looking at of detail. The one one, slightly finer. The uh, two one, you're starting to slice it finer. And then the, um, the two three, you're starting to slice it, slice it even finer here. But can you imagine if I had a reflection that went through in this dimension? What would happen? What, what kind of information would we get from that lattice? I'm not sure I understand. What so if I sliced through this lattice here, bearing in mind that a reflection is made by, by when, when the lattice goes through one of these reciprocal lattice points. If I slice through in this line here, what would I see for that reflection? And you're not hitting any lattice points. Correct. So you remember when I said that we have unique values of HKL that are reflection conditions. This is why we have values of HKL which are also absent. It's because they don't cut any of the lattice points when you go through there. There's no constructive interference that causes reflections. And that's why some reflections are allowed and some reflections are not. And I really thought I had a nice example of that on, on these graphs, but I, I think I'm missing one. Uh, or maybe I do. Actually, I do. I do have that. Uh, so to take this into looking at this single cell here, you have the two minus one lattice line, which is through here. You have the one zero, the two one, two three, and then this one here is the one one. And what this is showing you is how different reflections slice or have a slicing across the human cell here. And this is what, in two dimensions, these reflections mean. They just mean that you're taking a sampling through the through the the crystallographic unit cell in different directions. Could you go back to the slide that just shows the two negative one on its own? Negative uh, indice seems more difficult to. Uh, well, in the negative indice, the B, B axis is actually along here. So instead of going Instead of going to the same axis there, you're actually going back to, to that one there. So that's the negative. So negative one in B is that dimension. 
Actually, I think that uh, that should be the way that one will stay on the side. But instead of going to that B, the, the line should go. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because that's the B translation in this dimension. So that's one B. Um, so that so that's zero in terms of B. That would be um, one if it went in that direction, and it's zero if it goes in that direction. Uh, sorry, zero if, it, zero if it stays in this direction, one if it went that way, and then minus one if it stays down here. Just because we've got a, a, a lattice that looks like that. If I put a if I put a, um, a square lattice up, this would, this would be a lot easier to draw. Um, and this is just an example illustrating what I was showing um, before. Um, there may be some lattice planes which don't actually go through through one of these points, so you do not see any reflection from that one. You see a reflection from that one, not from that one, reflection from that, not from that one, reflection from that, not from that one, etc. Um, if you imagine if I had a, um, a body-centered uh, system here, you'd have a, um, a reciprocal lattice point that was sitting there, and you'd see that you'd start to get a reflection from that one because you'd have the body-centered there. So in, in this particular case, you can distinguish um, a primitive cell from a body-centered cell by the primitive cell lacking this reflection, but the body-centered one actually having that reflection. Does that, does that make sense? Right. But so you're saying like half of the four six lattice planes give a reflection? Well, no, a all certain of, proportion of them. All of the four six ones are absent in this case because they don't pass through any of these, these lattice points. Now, if I had a point there, that particular 4-6 reflection would, would pass through it. But that point there would also be a point that would be here, and a point that would be somewhere there. But within the complete lattice, these lines would start passing through some of those points if I put one in. Actually, I think I might make a slide where, where I put that one in there and you can see that. But that's how you distinguish between the different types of space group and packing because of absences and, and, and the presence of different reflections. That's why you have that list of HKL has to be even, or H0L has to be even. And that's, that's why reflections are present or reflections are absent. But isn't every single plane you drew on that slide a 4-6 plane? Um, it can be. No, because the... The 4-6 plane, so the 4-6 plane is that one, that one, that one, that one. The red one has a wider spacing. So, no, it's not. Uh, I need to label the different planes. So, the black one here is a, I think it's a bond one. Or is it a, is it two, three? And the red one is half of that, and then the blue one is a quarter of that. So the four six plane is not is not this it's not the red plane. It's the I good. see. Yeah. I understand what you're yeah. trying to show now. Yeah. I sorry. That's okay. As I say, I, 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 these are new slides that. <sighs> this is Bernard's representation of it, which is actually much better, but. So, it's the same thing I was showing. So there's three sets of lattice planes, two dimensions, with increasingly tighter spacing from red to blue to green. Um, so the red ones are here, uh, and the Miller indice for the 1-1 one, one for the red set, because you're, you're going, and it depends on how you define the axes here, but you're going uh, one long, one up, one long, one up, one long, one up for the red set. The, uh, the blue set is two minus one. So in the blue set, you're going two across minus one, uh, 
2 across minus 1. Uh, and in the green set, it's a free one. So in the green set, you go 1, 2, 3, and then up 1. Oh, that's right. So you do it for this one. Then 1, 2, 3, and then up 1. And they're sampling it more and more finely. Um, And this is sort of something very similar here. These are the middle indices and planes that are parallel to the unit cell edges. Um, so you've got the two zero reflection. Um, well, that means it goes two across, zero down. That's going through there, two across. And the d spacing is the, the inter, uh, interplane distance. Um, this is the three across one, or zero three, so it's going, it's sampling unit cell. By, so I need to, to, to reset it. So the two zero one is sort of sampling this unit cell at, at one half, but so it goes two over the a dimension. It's, so the a dimension of two, sorry, a dimension of two. So it's sampling these points. This one here is zero three, so it's the the, the b over three any time it's sampling. And this one here is uh, D50, so it's sampling the A coordinate um, every fifth cell. Um, have I confused you more than, than I told you? I don't know. There, I've tried looking at this this one. There's kind of two ways to do it, I guess, I've considered, where he, he kind of starts it out by showing, like, the vectors mm -hmm. and the direct space integers, negative 2b, 1a, and then taking the reciprocal, and that's like kind of one method, and then the other one's directly just looking at it and looking at the intercepts going directly to the middle end to see. Both, well, both kind of useful, I guess, but. Well, I guess the important thing to realize here are the, the, the middle indices basically to find a plane within the crystal. Um, it's not an individual point, but it's a slice through the crystal. And the, the higher the order of the Miller indices, to find the sampling of that unit cell. So as the order increases, so as this goes from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20, it's sampling at finer and finer and finer intervals. So the higher Miller indices are higher resolution, because they're sampling the cell in finer detail. Uh, to get a, a reflection, they have to pass through a reciprocal lattice point. That's why you actually have reflections that are present and absent. And they define the uh, what kind of cell you've got, whether you've got like a, uh, uh, a body-centered or a face-centered. Uh, they will, those absences and, and presence of reflections will define that. Now we're going into three dimensions now. Um, and basically, if you have a plane here where you start from zero, you have a one, one, one plane, it means that you go from the zero position here to um, B1, C1, A1. So you get this plane that looks like that. Um, if you have the zero, one, zero, it means that you go zero in A, you go zero in B, and just one in C. So that point there defines that condition. Um, this one here shows you that the the, the planes repeat um, at a distance, which is uh, this this distance, the B distance, one over one. This one here shows you that the the two zero zero. Uh, plane is generated by um, zero in, in A, zero in C, and then one half of the the uh, uh, B coordinate. Uh, and because it's repeated, it's also at the edge of the unit cell and also at the largest extent of the unit cell. It's sort of saying that what are the conditions in the unit cell where A can be 0, 
B is 2, and um, C is 0. And these work, that's the plane that's defined by those. It's, it's uh, repeated into the other two planes that we work, because uh, it's sampling the unit cell face and every, every half. So, no indices describe the lattice planes. Uh, so, the number of times a set of planes intersects on each axis and then the integer. Uh, and we'll look at diffraction geometry in a second. It's probably harder to think of them in three dimensions than using two dimensions. Uh, but one of the things that might be useful is to, to, to draw a cube even and then assign yourself you know what industry and work out where that would be in the cube. <sighs> so, I'm not going to go into this in detail, um, but what I'm going to say is actually said in the next text that will come up here. It's possible to do a very simple vector approach to defining what a plane looks like. Um, and unless you want to get into indexing or working out a lot of detail about where your your planes are, you don't really need to know this. What's important to notice is that um, there's a relationship between reciprocal space and real space, which can be um, followed by, by this kind of vector notation here. So you probably will not need to, to worry about that. It's a quick question about that. I don't know. It's important. You said that all is equal to an uppercase I. What is, what is that? Yeah. Which one is that? Your vector uh, notation uh, there. Is that not one? That's the identity matrix. Identity. So it's one zero 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 one zero 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 one. It's just one in the diagram. Oh. So you get a, a one that would be down there. Gotcha. And then these should be zero. And it just defines the relationship between real space and reciprocal space. Um, hopefully you'll never have to use that, because when you start Dealing with both spaces, it's kind of annoying. Uh, so each reciprocal lattice point, HKL, represents a set of parallel equidistant lattice planes with no indices HKL in real direct space. Um, tight real space lattice planes is high sampling density. Uh, that means that it's high resolution. And a large reciprocal lattice means lots of diffraction spots. So, how would you tell if you had a salt crystal? From the diffraction? Yeah, from the diffraction. If I had a diffraction pattern from a salt crystal, what would it look like? You have a lot of high resolution spots. Why would I have a lot of high resolution spots? Low, no, no, high resolution spots. Very few high resolution. I'd actually have I'd actually have high resolution because they diffract quite well, but I'd have very few spots because the the, the lattice spacing for salt crystal is very small. So uh, a large reciprocal lattice has lots of diffraction spots. A small reciprocal lattice means very few. So when I get a salt crystal, I'd see three or four spots, but they'd be fairly high resolution and fairly strong. Um, if I've got a large um, reciprocal lattice. So say how they have a virus crystal. I don't know if you've seen diffraction patterns from viruses. They're beautiful. There's spots all over the place. They're so dense. Um, which is another interesting thing as well, because the, the amount of diffractive radiation is really going to be very, very similar. And if you have a very small crystal that just has a couple of spots, the intensities of those is going to be very, very strong. But as you go to larger and larger reciprocal lattices, if you divide that intensity out, 
amongst all those other spots that you get, it gets uh, the intensity of the spots gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That's not quite true. There's other factors that are involved, but this is why, um, well, this is one of the reasons why you might want to go after a unit cell that's a monomer value of a diamond if you can. If you get a number of different crystals, that might give you higher resolution than if you have an assembly or a ligand in unit cell. It's also why the larger the molecule, the more problematic the uh, the uh, getting good high resolution data from it becomes. Um, but it is, who is, you know, some of us, who is actually um, teaching phasing methods? Is that Bob? Is he going to be doing that? Do you happen to know the topic? I don't know. Okay. Um, Because what this slide talks about is uh, anomalous scatter. Um, and absence of the anomalous scattering contribution is the diffraction pattern is centrosymmetric. And what it means is that the contributions of the 1-1 one one and the 1-1 one one reflection are the same um, for, for that particular, particular space group. Um, I'm not doing the, the phasing technique. Uh, it's Bob. Okay, so he'll, he'll, he'll go into this in a lot more detail. Um, probably lots of mathematical detail as well, so Tom <laughs> will be very happy in the back of <laughs> um, But basically, um, for phasing, or one method phasing, we rely on a property that, that you can break the center of symmetry. And your your otherwise identical reflections can be different. Um, I'm not going to go into why or how here. I'm going to leave that to Bob when he, he takes it. But I'll just mention it. So the reciprocal lattice and reflection intensities. So the reciprocal lattice is a mathematical point. Devoid of, any, devoid of any contents. So you consider the, the lattice point here. Uh, and the contents of the reciprocal lattice in terms of the observed diffraction intensities result by scattering from all the electrons in the atoms in the unit cell sampled at those discrete directions at those reciprocal lattice points. So overlaid on the lattice point is where your, your molecule would be. And the diffraction is the contribution of all those molecules within that lattice plane. Um, so that's why I said where you're sampling more and more finely, you are probably missing more and more of these individual lattice points. Your intensity is getting weaker because there's less atom, there's less molecules contributing to it. Um, so that's what the reciprocal lattices are. Um, So we've sort of slipped from chapter six to chapter five, uh, but these are the key concepts of it. Uh, some of them are actually repeated. The protein crystals belong to one of 65 space groups. Uh, the lattices, unit cells, and multiple orange, uh, origins. Uh, a lattice is a construct that describes space into a regular trans translation of periodic units. Um, it's divide, defined by the vectors A, B, and C, which define the given lattice. Uh, it's translationally periodic. It's an infinite assembly. Uh, we assume it's infinitely infinite for, for practical purposes. Uh, there are symmetry operations, which define how to generate an identical copy of the, the OT for the asymmetric unit. The asymmetric unit contains all necessary information to generate the complete unit cell of the crystal structure by applying the symmetry operations. Uh, the motif itself does not have to be constrained within the boundaries of the asymmetric unit. Uh, asymmetry of the motif places limitations on its position. Uh, so if you have a motif that has a defined shape and you have symmetry elements, 
you can't have those symmetry elements there if they place that motif over another motif that's there. They can't clash. Um, there's also non-crystallographic symmetry, which I talked about in the first lecture. I've talked about crystallographic coordinates. So you have a fractional coordinate, x, y, and z, which is basically uh, where x and y and z are between 0 and 1, 0 and 1. And they are defined in, in in real space by x times the vector a, y times the vector b, z times the vector z, c. And I say vector here because if you have a, a cell that has uh, 90 degree angles, then it's just a simple multiplication. But if you don't have 90 degrees, there is a directional component there. 14 three dimensional gravis lattices belong to seven crystal systems. Uh, And in those crystal systems, only plane rotations and screw axes are allowed for protein structures, otherwise you, you change the chirality. Uh, each crystallographic symmetry operator can be described in a, a symbolic form. Uh, those are actually given in the, the international tables. Uh, 14 Bravis lattices with the combination of plane rotation and screw axes give 65 chiral space groups. Uh, space groups with the highest degrees of freedom are P21 to 1, P21 and C2, and they're the ones that occur most commonly. And uh, I've talked about reflections in the reciprocal lattice and uh, planes, and basically the higher or the closer the interplane spacing, the larger the indices HKL, and the more tightly the HKL slice the sample cell. Tight sampling means more information. Thus, high HKL is equivalent to reciprocal lattice points far from the origin, and they provide more detail about the sample structure. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a bit now and um, talk a little bit about X-rays themselves. Um, so we've got about another we'll go up to noon this class. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so X-rays were discovered by Wilhelm Conrad Lundschen. He was a physicist in, in Germany, and he was working with with tubes, uh, basically a, a vacuum tube with uh, a metal target in there and a, um, a large amount of electricity coming into it that emitted invisible radiation that could be detected using fluorescent screen. So the time these experiments were done. What they had was this machine that was sitting there and a screen that was fluorescent. And they had the screen in front of the machine and they could see something on the screen. It wasn't a diffraction pattern or anything like that. Um, he actually noticed that this radiation would pass through things that were in between the screen. I don't know how the experiment was done, but he had the screen there. There was something in the way. It was a device, switched the device on, and he saw that the screen fluoresced. So, uh, he immediately uh, convinced Frau Rogen, his wife, uh, to put her hand in the screen. And this is a picture of what her hand looks like with the, the ring on. That's the, uh, so this was the first example of uh, X-ray, not X-ray crystallography, but the first example of X-rays used in a medical application to actually see, see the scales in there. Um, there were various X-ray machines which appeared. Um, the, the history of them is quite interesting. Um, so is the advertising that went with them, because they built more and more powerful machines that had more and more X-rays, which were obviously more and more healthy. <laughs> yeah, so so it, it's, it's quite interesting to, uh, to, to see it. Uh, in 1901, Ronchin was awarded the first Nobel Prize in physics. Um, so X-ray, X-rays and X-ray crystallography and Nobel Prizes go a long way back. Uh, and I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I made a, this famous picture belongs to a colleague, uh, Rudolf Albert von Kolika. Uh, soft tissue, largely composed of light atoms such as carbon and oxygen, uh, weakly absorbs hard X rays. The calcium phosphate in the bone absorbs considerably more, and presumably gold absorbs a lot. Uh, do you know what the 
uh, absorption of x-rays is related to. It's the atomic number, but it's actually the square of the atomic number. So things like hydrogen, um, or actually any interaction with x-rays is related to the square of the atomic number. So things like hydrogen don't have very much interaction at all. Um, when you talk to selenium, I'll talk about selenium, which we use for phasing, the interaction of selenium is huge, so we've got a very, very big signal. Uh, but this is also why in crystallography that the hydrogen is uh, not usually seen within the structure, so don't interact with the x-rays very well, you don't get that much information from it. It's also why uh, if you have metals in your system, you'll find them very easily, uh, because they have very large interaction with the x-rays. Um, do you know why we use X-ray structure crystallography, or crystallography in general? Why, 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 why bother? Why do we need it? Need the short wavelengths to sample the. It's fine detail, the atomic detail. Well, how do you have big is protein? You mean like weight size or size? That's, that's the reason why I'm using them is because the light is about 300 nanometers and it's still visible. That's about 3,000 angstrom. Um, if you take, you know, typical proteins, the maybe a few hundred angstroms across, it basically means the proteins are smaller than the wavelength of light. So we can't use a microscope to see them. We can't get down to actually visualize them. Uh, X-rays are about one angstrom or 0.9 millimeters, uh, nine, uh, 0.1 nanometers. And the X-rays can be expressed in a number of terms. Um, they can ex be expressed in nanometers. Uh, they can be expressed in angstrom, which is actually a historic term. The reason angstroms are used is because it's very, very convenient for crystallographers because the hydrogen distance is about three angstrom or something. So you get an immediate idea of uh, what it is. All they can be expressed in energy. And if you go to the synchrotron and you talk to the beamline scientists, they'll tell you what energy do you want. And you know, 12 keV is about one angstrom. Um, energy is inversely related to the wavelength. So um, the the Wavelength that we have upstairs in the lab, which is <laughs> okay. The wavelength in the lab is copper K alpha. It's about 1.54 angstrom, which works out to about 8 keV or 8,000 electron volts. Um, do you know why one angstrom is a good value to use? Makes the math easier. It does make the math easier. <laughs> um, it's also very close to the anomalous diffraction wavelength for selenium. So if you design all your instrumentation so it works with one angstrom, you can use it for bad phasing fairly effectively. Uh, but here we've got the um, the electromagnetic spectrum. So we've got radio waves down here, radar, microwave, infrared. Then we have visible light, and we have the radiation defined as non-ionizing or ionizing. So non-ionizing is this side, and non-ionizing means that it does not damage, uh, it doesn't ionize uh, molecules. So, you know, radio is, you can basically stand in front of a, a, a radio station and it doesn't affect you. You can stand in front of a radar and it doesn't affect you. You can stand in front of a microwave and it may start to affect you a little bit. <laughs> um, you feel a little bit warmer. Uh, and you've got red light, infrared light, which is heat, heat from the sun. Actually, it's, it's a whole bunch of things. So. And then you get down to the blue and the ultraviolet. And when you get down to these wavelengths, you're actually going from low energy to high energy. And these start to have enough energy here that they can actually knock out uh, electrons in, in atoms. So they're called ionizing radiation. Um, X-rays are about here. 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 10. They are ionizing, they do cause damage, and that's basically why we, we operate daily function at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, just as a matter of interest, do you know why 
the cryogenic temperature we use is less than 120 Kelvin. You know what radiation does to a, to a protein crystal? X-ray radiation. Or the process. Mm -hmm. Not really. Okay, what happens is it's ionizing radiation. So it breaks bonds. Uh, primarily what it breaks in a protein crystal is water because that's what most of a protein crystal is. The X-ray radiation hits the crystal. It breaks the water into free radicals, that's OH minus and free hydrogen gas, and electrons. Now, if you do an experiment at the beam line where you have a crystal that's frozen and you get someone or remotely put a block in front of that freezing stream after you've collected your data, you'll see the crystal go like a scrambled egg. And that's basically because of the hydrogen that's produced in the free radicals. Now, it turns out that for the 120K, those free radicals are actually trapped in place, so they can't move. If you go above 120 K, they can. Um, the electrons move anyway. You can't really stop them until you get down to extremely low temperatures, which are in the few kelvins, and that's not practical. So what you're doing is you're stopping free radical motion. You're trapping those free radicals in place. Um, if you're above 120 K, those free radicals are mobile, and the cooling process slows them but doesn't stop that damage. So that's why we use about 100K in all these gas streams. It's the point where the damage is, is minimized. Now this is a very, very important equation. And what it's saying is that the energy is equal to Planck's constant times the velocity. Is that, what is that frequency? Frequency. Um, now, this can also be written as 12,398 divided by the wavelength in angstrom gives you the energy in electron volts. So when you go to the beam line and they talk about energies, this is the equation that converts energy to, to wavelength. Um, I think I've got some better slides than, than, than these here, but I'll use these for the moment and I'll introduce the next slides in the next one. Um, this is a electromagnetic wave. It has an electric vector E, and it has a magnetic vector, which is the right angles to the electric vector. Um, the waves have wavelength, as notated by the lambda here, and waves also have phase. Phase is notated by the position here. So zero, maximum, zero, minimum, zero, maximum. And phase is given in radians. Zero is zero. Pi radians is 180 degrees. Two pi is 360 degrees. Um, the electric field vector, that's the E part here, interacts with the electrons in the molecule, causes them to oscillate. This is how X-ray diffraction actually works. So the X-ray the pulse that's coming in has this electric field. It causes the um, electrons in the, um, in the atom to actually oscillate. And as those electrons oscillate, they give off energy. And that energy is X-ray radiation that they emit. So your wave comes in, comes in like that, it oscillates the electron, and that causes another X-ray wave to go out. And that's why we get diffraction. Um, there's no lenses for x-rays, that's, that's not true. Uh, you can make a lens for x-rays, but you, they are very impractical. Um, they're made of basically uh, large pieces of metal with, with large circles drilled in them. You can focus slightly, but not very much. Um, but the refractive index is practically unity for all materials. So you can't really focus, you can't use x-rays like a microscope, essentially. Um, now, I'm going to hit this again in the next lecture. It's really, really important. Um, but we're going to talk about interference. And this is what I drew on the, the board before. If you have two waves like this one, 
So this one is 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0. And you have another wave here, which is 0, minus 1, 0. If you add these two points up here, the sum is nothing. You get no, no diffraction, no wave. So this is called destructive interference. Um, uh, I actually need, a, I, I have a couple more slides which I'll put in for the, for the, for the next talk. For the um, so waves have a amplitude, that's this value here, and they have a phase. Now, if I were to take a wave and sample it at some point, uh, the phase wouldn't be zero, it would be some point along here. So if I wanted to sample a wave and plot it in two dimensions, um, what I can do is plot it as a complex number. Now, complex numbers have real and imaginary components. The real component is the amplitude. The real component is how, how much energy almost is in this wave. So what we have is a wave has a certain energy value is a real component. And then we give it an angular component, uh, which tells it where it is in terms of phase. So if I were to sample the wave at this point here, which is zero, uh, what I would have is a line that just went in one direction. Okay? If I were to sample it at, uh, let's say, 90 degrees somewhere here, then it would be the same energy because this amplitude of the wave is the same. But my notation would be an arrow that went straight up like that. So this is one way that we can take a wave that's generated and put it into a notation in two dimensions where we have both the amplitude and the phase information on it. I will come back to this in, in the next talk. And this is called an Argand diagram. Uh, it's a complex number representation of the wave. The wave has a real component, F, and the imaginary component, the cosine of this, this angle. The reason that this is important is because what we can do is take several waves. So these are different waves. These would be different reflections. We can plot these on the Nargan diagram, and what we can say is that the actual contribution that we get out, uh, I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake in what I said there. These are individual waves from different atoms. They're not, they're not different reflections. But what we can do is we can take the summation of all these waves, F1 plus F2 and plus F3, we'll take it out there, and this actually defines what the reflection that we get for each individual component is. Um, and this is, uh, again, I'm going to go into this into a lot more detail in the next lecture. But the, the F, or the structure factor, is equal to the summation of all the, the real elements of these waves and the phases. Um, and as I say, I'll, I'll get into this in detail in the next lab shot. Um, but what I think I'll do is, is I'll finish off with this argon diagram notation, and then for the next one, I'll show you why it's important. Uh, but complex numbers, uh, this is how you, you add them together. You can add two complex numbers with a real and imaginary components add. Um, you can multiply complex numbers. Um, again, you get a real component and a imaginary component. You can represent them in an exponential form. Um, we will be, will be doing that. Um, you can change the sign and change the phase. And this is what an Argan diagram looks like. Um, I'm going to stop there, and in the next lecture, I'm going to throw in a lot more detail about how these argon diagrams are represented. Actually, I may. I don't know if I've actually got that on this computer. So, I don't. 
So we'll stop here and I'll, I'll show you that in the next lecture.